and welcome to the Business Octopus, where we talk about all things sales, marketing, and technology. I'm Avon Collis, CRM and Marketing Automation Specialist at Relevate, and all-around good guy. And today I'm joined with Alex Franklin from First Principles Consulting, here to talk about the effective organization. Welcome, Alex. How are you going? Yeah, thanks, Avon. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Now, tell us a little bit more about um, yourself, what you do, and how you help. Sure. Um, So my background is uh, as an electrical engineer, and I found myself working in the corporate consulting uh, and project management space for eight years, about eight years, uh, on some of the the biggest and and most critical projects in the world. Um, And I I came to realize there's a um, there's a gap in the market where small businesses need a lot of the help and the knowledge and expertise that's kind of bundled up at the corporate level. Um, but isn't available. Uh, and so I started the, uh, the small medium enterprise division of First Principles Consulting to try and unlock that um, and bring that knowledge to, to small business owners. Yeah, right. So I guess, um, you know, we, we're sort of talking about how to make an effective organisation. So obviously that lends it to the fact that there are some organizations that are very ineffective and, and I personally have spoken to or, or known a few to be very ineffective. Um, so why are they ineffective or why are they not effective and what makes them not effective? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, I think every business can be summed up quite simply as a combination of people, processes and technology um, and the successful or the effective organizations, the ones that get the priorities right and do that in the right order. Um, And I think what a lot of people do is they confuse technology as the solution rather than enabling a solution. Um, And so if you think about an effective organization as having um, effective and efficient processes, people operate those processes and then technology enables the solution. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely automate a process, but if it's a bad process, then you just do bad things at scale. So <laughs> yeah, you get bad results faster. Definitely makes sense. Now, I know, I know that there are, like I, I've, I've dealt with a lot of organizations and I would say a lot of not-for-profits and government organizations are inherently inefficient or ineffective. Mm-hmm. Um, what might be some of the drivers to that? We, um, we have a model that we like to use that we call the effective organization. Um, and it's got five, five elements to it. Um, and it, it's basically built like a, a pyramid with four, four elements stacked on top. Um, and then in the center is um, why. Why does the organization exist? What's its purpose? Um, so that's, that's a big one for small organizations. Um, even big organizations, other than a profit for a shareholder, they don't really know what they're doing or why they're doing something. Um, And it can also be the the basis for um, not being able to change or respond to to internal and external factors. And COVID is a really good example of that, um, where we had external factors affecting businesses. Businesses knew they had to change, but they couldn't quite communicate it. um, Mm. Why they had to go, well, we we can't operate from a shop anymore, so we've had to go online. Um, So I think that not understanding that why is a key driver. Um, the other four elements in our, in our model is empowered leadership. Um, so the people element, um, getting the right people on the bus, um, in the right seats, uh, the commitment culture rather than a compliance culture. And so um, creating discretionary effort or promoting discretionary effort rather than I do this because I have to. Um, the enablers, which are the tools and technology and then the processes and methodology. So wrapping those all together creates an effective organization. Yeah, I think a lot of times people give people, uh, give their staff or teams or whatever um, tasks, but then want to control it a a, a lot with no room for failure. Um, But if they don't fail, they don't learn, they don't drive, they don't feel like they want to succeed or be motivated to do things. And so nothing, you're never surprised in a pleasant way. Yeah, yeah. And um, systems, those are used for compliance. And it's, yeah. why haven't you done this? Not, I've noticed something is wrong. How can we help? Yes, yeah, exactly right. And I think that, um, the, the, like, I've experienced a massive difference between um, someone who is just there to tick the boxes and go home uh, versus someone who really wants to make something happen. And so, 
it's been incredible to have the the, the two differences. So what what are some of the, like I guess what are the top three things to identify if you have a really ineffective uh, organization? What's some of the question? Well, yeah. what are some of the warning signs? Um, I I think about it in terms of effective and efficient. So you need to be effective before you can be efficient, which is what we talked about with automation. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have the right process and you automate it, then you're just going to annoy people. Yeah. Um, so I would look at where you are effective or ineffective overall in delivering what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, so if you make widgets, are you making the right widgets? Mm. Um, and then look at being, being efficient after that. Um, and within those two concepts, you can then break that down. Is it a people problem, a process problem, or a technology problem? I, I know that, um, you know, coming from the technology side, you know, we are ideally we want those processes to be quite well matured before mm -hmm. we automate it particularly in those startup businesses or those younger smaller businesses who are still trying things and they I, I think people don't try and fail enough uh, in that you know we want to do x because we think it's right but the customer wants that so it's like field of dreams if you build it they will come is not the case Yes. So, so doing that sort of like uh, throw spaghetti at the wall method where you try with a little MVP, you get people to try, uh, see how it works, improve it, improve it, and then start to, you know, build those, those processes. I think it's very similar um, coming at it from a different angle. Mm. So yeah. what, what, what I guess that rolls into, what are some of the ways to become more effective in an organisation? Um, for me, it all starts with the why. Um, why does the organization exist? Why do you do it? What, what are the values and the standards? Um, that really helps you attract and hire um, the right people in your team. And so what a lot of organizations, large and small, do is they hire on technical competency. Mm -hmm. Are you certified? Do you have experience? Fantastic. We've got a seat for you. Um, rather than the behavioral competency, what mm -hmm. are your values? What are your beliefs? Do you actually fit in the team? Um, and it comes back to that, that high-performing team that you talked about with that trust and that mm -hmm. lack of trust, um, where we can't trust the person sitting next to it, us. That really creates problems with the culture and you, you, can't, lead, you can't lead your way out of that. I think uh, I was speaking to the uh, CEO of the Collingwood Football Club and they said mm -hmm. that when you first got in there, they had horrendous turnover, not only of members, but also of staff. And the, the, the people who were managing the memberships saw the members as kind of like cattle or they, they kind of had a disdain for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably half the chain. People sign up, you know, want to support their club, and then they go, this is crap, and they leave. Yep. And so he started evaluating everyone on fit. Someone might be great at their job. But if they just talk to customers like dirt, um, they, weren't the, they weren't the right fit. They didn't have the culture that was required. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that culture first mentality really changed that. And they, their membership virtually doubled over, over a, a year or so. So I, I definitely think that there's a, there's a lot of, you know, understanding the reason behind why someone might be like a customer on the end is frustrated about something. But if you know what you're trying to deliver at the end result, when they get past that frustration and get to, oh, wow, I can't believe how amazing this service is or that customer or process is or whatever, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's where the magic happens. That's, that's my favourite spot to play in. So, yeah, I think, yeah, um, yeah I mean, you, you're definitely right about um, that, that sort of sense of purpose and culture. Um, so are there any other ways for an organisation to become more effective? Um. The, we've talked about the, the big one is technology and, and that's really about driving efficiency um, mm -hmm. and, and getting the processes right. So um, we think in terms of two um, operational processes, one's at a functional level, which we call the functional operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might be marketing or sales or how you actually deliver value, um, your people systems. Mm -hmm. They're the day-to-day, -day, that's kind of your, your day in, your day out. Um, yeah. It's where a lot of people get stuck in their thinking um, and it's all about getting to the end of the day, the end of the week, delivering for this, this client. Mm -hmm. um, and what a lot of businesses don't make the leap to is having a management system. Um, historically, they were called um, uh, MOS, a management operating system. Um, 
that sits over the top. And it's all about the bigger picture. So who are we? Um, what are we doing it for? Who's our ideal client? Uh, and that's that, that cultural fit. It's not just internal, uh, but it's external. Like you said, with, with clients, who are we actually trying to approach and target and, and why? Mm-hmm. Um, and then how do we take our, our vision, our mission, our goals, our objectives and actually translate it into, um, into results for the business? Uh, and so this management system sits over the top and it runs the day-to-day, but it also gives you the bigger picture. Um, and it's comprised of the Deming cycle, which is the plan, do, check, act. Um, and it's that, it's that concept you thought you were talking about before where mm-hmm. it's that fail fast. Lots of people try something, they plan, they do, but they don't check and act. And so you end up with all these half-built bridges. And a bridge is only effective if it's 100% because otherwise you're not getting across the river or, or the, the canyon. Mm-hmm. Um, so having a system that gives you that power to go, this didn't work because X, Y, Z, mm-hmm. we need to tweak this or we need to make the shift. And then you start the cycle again. And so then you build in continuous improvement. Um, so over time, your business becomes unstoppable because every day, week, month, year, you're becoming that little bit better. Mm. Um, and you're, um, you're responsive, not reactive to the changes around you. So I think that's the big one. And I, I would say that that would be important to understand where something went wrong so that that, you know, this was tried once before and it didn't work because I know in a large organisation, you know, you might have five people with the same awesome idea. Um, mm-hmm. Three of them try the same wrong approach. Two of them try uh, or one of them tries an okay approach and another one finds an awesome approach. But that three times the wrong way probably wasn't the best <laughs> uh, to be repeated three times, let alone the fact that it was a bad idea. Um, and, you know, I, I guess from the, as the systems guy, I kind of try to bake in two things, uh, you know, building knowledge management into the system, kind of like goes back to what you're saying at the start where um, you want people to win or to succeed and allow them to surprise you with how awesome they are at something. So put them information in the middle so that they can find how to do something, not constantly asking you. It makes them feel more powerful, um, more self-sufficient, and, um, and then they feel like they can achieve stuff. Um, the other one is, you know, building that culture into the system. You know, like we have chat feeds and we have put posts like cat videos and GIFs and things when someone has a win, um, mm-hmm. you know, we just celebrate someone's, you know, awesome achievement or, or something like that. So I think it can start very simple, but I think it can also be quite complex. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's getting those small things right. Um, and we describe one of our values as, um, as having the ability to be a little bit mischievous because yeah. from a cultural point of view, if you can have a joke with someone, mm-hmm. you've got that psychological safety to, yeah. to have that innovative, um, I can take a risk kind of culture. Mm. Um, from that, that knowledge capture side, um, if you have someone that goes, well, we've tried this three times and it doesn't work and they leave, mm. the next person that comes along is going to reinvent the wheel. And I think that's where a lot of businesses burn a lot of time and their energy and, and, and financial resources doing that reinvention of the wheel in, in uh sort of means spinning of the wheels <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> not really going anywhere yeah yeah no I, I think one of the um in the military they have a concept of uh, central command or mission command and that mm-hmm. is you know central command is everything flows through one person but we already are uh, bombarded with information every day we don't pull out the full context so if then everything's got to go through that one person or the owner or the um you know one particular manager they'll get burnt out and then they'll leave or, you know, not make the right decisions or, or something. So having that, those like work groups or, you know, people responsible, I found that much better ideas come from other people than other than me, even in my own business. So it's kind of like you've just got to be more of a conductor and orchestrate those rather than um, control those. So yeah. if, if um, uh, given what we've spoken about, what what is the full benefits, I guess? What, what's the, the magical... Um, thing at the end of the rainbow that we get for becoming an effective organization? Um, I always think in terms of the burning platform metaphor, uh, which is it it started in, uh, came from uh, mid 1980s, I think. um, And two two oil workers were trapped on a a burning oil platform. Um, One of them decided to take the leap and to jump into the unknown, the deep, dark, cold waters in the middle of one of these far off seas um, and swim to the boat. Um, and 
the boat is kind of the promised land. And if you've seen Deep Water Horizon, it's a very similar storyline. Um, and so if we, the do nothing case, if we stay, what happens? And I think you perfectly um, articulated it before, the, the business owner, the business is running us. It will burn us out. It will destroy our relationships, our health, and just our, our passions for, for, uh, for whatever we're doing. Mm. Um, so if we take the leap and there's always pain and change, um, yeah. it's, it's kind of the growth zone um, uh, methodology or ID, idea. Um, we're getting to that, um, that stage with our business that it, it starts to run without us being that, that central command person. Mm. We've got that innovation. We've got lower turnover of staff. We're attracting the right people. We're attracting, connecting with the right clients. And we're not dealing with our time wasters and the Pareto where 20% of clients take up 80% of our time. We get rid of the 20%. Um, our operational costs go down. Our profits go up. Um, most importantly, we get our time back as, as business owners um, and our team is happy. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of other, like, big trends at the moment. So, you know, Google is pushing uh, uh, that psychological safety is a big part of their, you know, way to grow and, and stay, you know, innovative. And mm -hmm. then the other point you touched on was... Um, by ha having those sort of systems in place um, and allowing the company to sort of grow without you. It's kind of like, I, I kind of equate it to throwing a pebble off a mountain and you start a movement and you have like, a, it starts to snowball and grow and it gets bigger than you. So you're creating a movement or something bigger than yourself. And I think that's probably more exciting because I can only keep so much in my brain. I can only sleep so much. And I, I try to push those boundaries as much as I can already. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where I have my team managing me to make sure that I sleep, eat, um, do all those things. So um, I, I think that's there's something really special that could come from a, an effective organisation. So um, it's been really great talking with you today. I think I think we've uh, covered some amazing ground here. And uh, if you're listening and you want to find out more about uh, Alex Franklin, you can go to the website firstprinciplesconsulting.com.au. Um, I'll put the link to that and also Alex's um, LinkedIn in the comments or the notes below the episode. So thank you again for listening to the podcast. If you have any questions or if you'd like to be on the show, then you can check out relevate.com.au and fill out the contact form. Otherwise, thank you for listening and take care.